everyone, welcome back into another episode of Sports in the Midden. This is uh, Thomas Bendit, joined by Adam Biggers. How's everything going tonight, Adam? Everything's uh, going pretty well. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's pretty hot, humid, sticky day, I yeah. guess. It's like, <laughs> br almost brutally uncomfortable. But um, we have a couple of topics we want to talk to you guys about. Uh, Jim Harbaugh and the Rich Eisen Show today. Uh, the waters are hot, evidently. And I'll read the article from Angelique of the Detroit News. Uh, she watched the show. She quoted Jim. So we'll, we'll go through that. Whose job's safe? We're going to start spinning that uh, preseason hamster wheel with, where these conversations mean something, but do they really mean anything? Sometimes, I mean, it's, it's early, but I can feel fo football's coming along. I can feel it. I'm excited for football season, big time media days at the end of July. So. We'll get into that. We'll also talk about, a, in a previous podcast solo, I talked about the Michigan State sexual assault ordeal. Uh, Donnie Corley, Demetri Vance, and uh, Josh King all being dismissed from the program. Josh King facing uh, first-degree criminal sexual conduct charges. Uh, Vance and Corley facing third degree. So uh, that's on my personal channel. Go ahead and uh, view that. But today we are going to talk about the on-field implications. On field only, and we'll throw in Austin Robertson in this group too, because Michigan State, four big time freshmen from last year, Thomas, are not returning to the Spartans. So, how much does that change your outlook? How much we want to know how much does that change everyone uh, else's outlook out there? Uh, tweet us at Mitten Sports MI, tweet me at Adam Biggers 81, tweet Thomas at T Bendit. So, let's start with the Spartans conversation. I feel like it's a uh, it's kind of a slam dunk almost when you when you look at four guys that were expected. Donnie Corley was supposed to be a star. Mm -hmm. I thought Donnie Corley was the next superstar wide receiver at Michigan State. And we're talking long lines. I mean, even recently, guys like Mark Dell and B.J. Cunningham. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I felt like Corley could reach a cut above even those guys. And, I mean, I don't know. You know, Plaxico Burris, Derek Mason territory. I mean, we're talking Donnie Corley could have been an all-time great at Michigan State. So, um, you know, Demetri Vance had a chance uh, to make an impression. Michigan State need, needs help in the secondary. Josh King at defensive end. You know, Spartans have been searching for somebody ever since Shalik uh, Calhoun left. You know, and they don't have Marcus Rush anymore. I mean, they're big names have gone through. I mean, Thomas, I, I almost don't know where to start, but four yeah. – Four of the top t 10 freshmen from the 2016 class will not be there uh, this season. How, how does that strike you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first one to start with is obviously Corley. Um, and, again, just to preface to everyone, we're only talking on-field stuff. We're not talking about anything else. Um, right. Just for next season and beyond. The thing about Corley is, you know, we've seen guys have nice freshman seasons and drop off, but – Cor Corley looked like a star. I mean, to me, I had no doubt if he would have continued his career, um, didn't have any significant injuries or anything like that, he would be playing in the NFL. I have no doubt about that a couple years down the line. I think he would have been all Big Ten. I think by his junior or senior year, he probably would have been um, one of the most dominant receivers in, in the Midwest, uh, in, in the Big Ten overall. People would have, and, people would have been talking about Corley by the time if, – if he went on the course that a lot of people thought he was destined for. We're talking greatest, one of the greatest receivers at Michigan State. And that's not hyperbole. That's not a stretch. That, that's honest truth right there. I mean, Don, Donnie Corley had, had a, a, just a fantastic destiny awaiting him at Michigan mm -hmm. State. And, and, and if we even take that destiny out, you know, and just talk about what he was, um, Tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I think he was clearly the second best offensive player coming into this season, um, behind Scott, obviously. But I I don't know if I would if if I'm doing a draft and I'm picking the offense, I don't know if I'm picking anyone besides Scott over uh, Corley for this upcoming season, um, at least. And to me, you know, you start with that, you're losing. Um, again, in my in my opinion, I I think it's a relatively general generally held opinion, but the second best offensive player on an offense that wasn't exactly otherworldly last year. Um, and then, yeah, King, 
uh, Robertson and, and Vance as well. I mean, you're talking about uh, some four big pieces off of a what was a really good recruiting class in 2016 for the Spartans. I mean, um, it was a comparable with Alabama or Florida State or something like that. No, but for Michigan State, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that 2016 class is probably their their best in the recruiting era. You know, the online rankings. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. It's it's up there. I don't have the rankings ahead of me. I I want to say, no, uh, ranking wise, it was the best that Antonio's ever had. But if you look, um, well, I was going to say substance wise, but obviously not substance wise. I guess let me use a different word. If you look <laughs> football talent wise, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, we're talking about we're talking about Don, Donnie Corley. Not only not now you have to almost look at. You mentioned how bad Michigan State's offense was last year, and this offense was pathetic last year. You're looking at a quarterback now, Brian Lewerke. I thought, okay, at least one advantage Brian Lewerke is going to have is he's got an established running back in L.J. Scott and Gerald Holmes and Madre London. You know, he's got a, he's got a nice trio behind him. So that that's a plus. And then he's got a playmaking receiver. Mm-hmm. Okay, you won't have Josiah Price at tight end. Okay, they, they could work something out. Michigan State's had pretty good tight ends during the past 10 years. But I thought a major advantage was, okay, you have Donnie Corley. That's a safety net. That's gone. That, that's gone. I mean, LJ Scott's a talented running back. Uh, Gerald Holmes is a talented running back. Brian, I mean, Brian Lewerke, he's been tabbed the starter. He's good. Um, if he's got guys ahead of him, I mean, I – I'm not saying that the offense just falls to pieces without Donnie Corley, but I'm I'm saying Donnie was a big, big part of the plan. A oh, big part of the plan. I, he's gone. Yeah. So you can't you can't just say, okay, well, they lost a really good player. I mean, they lost a really good player. They they potentially lost, you know, three years of some of the best passing game Mark D'Antonio's had in his Lansing. That's what they also lost. Oh, I, I totally agree. And, and the thing, how I kind of look at it is, I think Michigan State's offense is going to have a much better floor this year than it did last year because I think the work is going to be more consistent than the quarterback position was last year. And, you know, having a, a what should be a pretty good backfield, um, I, I think is going to make them more consistent, more reliable. But, like, if you were going to have a good offense – I don't – Corley was going to be a huge part of it. I mean, yeah. if this was going to be that bounce-back season that certainly Spartan fans are hoping for, I I mean, I felt like Corley had to be have a big-time season. And, I mean, without him there, that's a huge, huge red flag. <clears throat> and then there was – Excuse a, me. And then Kenny Like, he's a, he could be a two-way player, wide receiver, defensive back. He transfers. So, I mean, that's – I mean, mm-hmm. you got to – I'm not saying the well is completely dry at Michigan State, and it's not end all be all with Donnie Corley. But mm-hmm. let's rewind. And Michigan State fans, if you're watching this, and, and Thomas, do you remember how Michigan State fans were? I remember how Michigan State fans were. If you rewind to when Donnie Corley committed, mm-hmm. this was um, as big to Michigan State fans as, like, let's say Rashawn Gary was to to yeah. Michigan. Um, it and I mean. Two different recruits and kind of two different universes. Rashawn up here, but I mean Donnie right, you know, Donnie's right there. Yeah. In that atmosphere. Arguably the best wide receiver of that class. Uh that I think he was ranked top ten or top fifteen. I mean, he he was elite. Mm-hmm. And he had thirty three catches last year, four hundred and fifty three yards as as a true freshman for a absolute dirt offense. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, 453 yards, 33 catches. I mean, that those numbers and three touchdowns, those numbers are incredible given the circumstances. Mm-hmm. You hope that Brian Lewerke develops. You hope, you know, as with that, every program, the offensive line uh, develops. We're not talking, this, you know, Michigan State had a great offensive line two, three, four years ago, and it kind of dropped off a little bit. Not, like I said, it's not end all be all. With Donnie Corley, but I mean, it's it is a bit it is a big chunk. You just don't replace. I mean, this is a guy that they planned around. This is a, this is a guy that they I feel like felt was going to be a cornerstone of the offense for you know three years. Well, I mean, 
I, I remember saying this when we were talking about Michigan having the, all the NFL departures, and I don't want to compare these. I'm not saying these guys are the same uh, player because one of them played a couple of years, one only played one year. But, you know, it, Corley, in, uh, in some ways to me, it, his importance to Michigan State is kind of like what Jabril Peppers was. And you just – you don't pick another Jabril Peppers off the tree. You don't pick another Corley off the tree. Um, you know, maybe if you're Alabama, you do, I guess. Right. But, you know, for, for an average – you know, for a program like Michigan State that they're not hauling in five five stars every year, um, you really need those guys to perform and, and live up to the expectations. And, I mean, I thought Corley was as good as advertised, if not better. Um, and, obviously – to lose out on that and have to go back to the drawing board is a uh, it's going to be a considerable challenge. And you know, as we mentioned, you know, there are plenty more players too. And I mean, uh, my my big second point though is is like you have this great great recruiting class, which I mean, it's still they have a lot of nice prospects on the on the roster from this class, or that I'm speaking of the 2016 class, but. To lose your top three guys for your top eight, I mean, that's a that's a devastating hit um, to that class. And, I mean, I think we all know that uh, Michigan State struggled on the recruiting trail in 2017, especially within the, the state borders. Um, looks like it's going to come back in 2018. I know it's very early. Uh, we still got months and months before signing day. Um, but it's uh, – you don't like to see – things kind of cratering down the hill, um, so to speak. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's I, – I had a tough time believing Michigan State was going to be above seven wins coming up before these guys were off. And, I mean, yeah. I, I have a tough time seeing it now. I don't know if I'm alone, but <laughs> – I mean, I, I, I think right now, re- realistically and, – and real quick to rewind, when you mentioned the importance thing, yes, as far as Corley and Peppers. And I remember – I don't want to mention the columnist name. I, I didn't agree with this. He was comparing Donnie Corley head to head with Jabril Peppers. And you can't do that. Yeah. yeah. Jabril played everything. Donnie Corley. Where Donnie does have some versatility, though, I mean, he could return punts and kicks if they needed him. But uh, there was talk about him being defensive back as well. I don't know how serious those talks were. I mean, they 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 were serious enough for Mark D'Antonio to address. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if there was something that was actually going to happen. But that. Athletically, yeah, bar none, Donnie Corley, uh, I have to believe, was the most athletic, most talented uh, offensive player at Michigan State, and and you no longer have him. And, yeah, predicting, I mean, I thought Michigan State, even with those guys, it would be difficult, mm-hmm. you know, seven-win season. I'm, I mean, four or five wins I, I think is realistic. I, I really do. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, uh the schedule in some ways is is more advantageous this year than it was last year, but uh, but yeah, I mean, unless Lewerke is legit, I mean, I I just I, I think I mean he is he is Brian Lewerke is a legit quarterback, but I mean, if I had, I want I wonder, and if you're and if you're Brian Lewerke too, if you're the quarterbacks and you're you're being recruited and you're like, okay, look, this is the guy that I'm going to be making big plays yeah. with all the time how does that affect you you know what i mean like how that i wonder about that i wonder if i if you're brian the working you're like oh crap <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah what? Don, donnie corley's not on the hold on donnie corley the wide receiver donnie corley he's not on team anymore <laughs> oh mean, okay um who do i who do i throw the ball to i mean that and obviously i'm being a little bit comical here but yeah it's not a laughing matter why he's gone, mm-hmm. but it is. It, it does kind of make you scratch your head and go, "Wow, did, did this really happen in Michigan State?" Now, the circumstances aside, it's just, "Wow, did this?" This. I, I I don't know. I just feel like this is a. What what a word of, but if if you want the worst case and the worst case scenario, again and circumstances aside, was you don't have Donnie Corley on your football team anymore. Yeah, and that came true, and they were unfortunate circumstances. But I mean, if I had to think of a worst case scenario for Michigan State football, like a year ago, before we, you know, we started hearing about all this stuff, I would yeah. have to, I'd have to say, well, worst case scenario in my mind would be no Donnie Corley. Yeah, and that is, uh, and that's the truth. And 
And real quick, Josh King, no, I mean, Josh King was one of the best defensive ends in, in the uh, 2016 class. Well, he was ranked higher than Corley. <laughs> yeah, he was their, high, their highest-ranked uh, recruit of that class. And, I mean, Demetric Vance, again, another a, a defensive back out of uh, Cass Tech, Corley out of uh, uh, – Donnie went to uh, Martin Luther King. Um, and Demetric, Demetric went to uh, Detroit Cass Tech. Josh King uh, – Hinsdale, Illinois, I forgot, Central or something like that. I think it's Hinsdale Central. It's in Hinsdale, Illinois, one of the one of the high schools there. And then, uh, who am I forgetting? And then Austin Robertson, I forgot where he's from. But, yeah. and again, Austin Robertson, a separate separate incident. And, uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna need him on the defense. Well, they were going to need him on the defensive line. Then they tell uh, defensive lineman Cassius Pete that he can't come back. I mean, Michigan State football is really, right now, it's, uh, I guess a tail tailspin might be too dramatic because it, that would imply that there's just, I mean, there's, I'm still confused with the Curtis Blackwell thing and we can talk about that another time. Yeah. How, how the instant change of philosophy all of a sudden after five years, I, I mean, I guess I don't, I guess I don't really understand that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, Kenny like transferring the thing with Cassius Pete. I mean, it's just not a great, it's not a great time for Michigan state image wise. Um, you know, when you tell a kid that he can't come back and he goes in the newspaper and, and tells his side of the story, that doesn't look good. Then again, you have three sexual assaults that are connected. You have one that's separate. Then you had all these other uh, incidents. It, it, it's just Michigan, Michigan State's image right now is, is suffering big time. Um, and it's like the polar, polar opposite image of Michigan. I mean, let's uh. You think when you think of Michigan football, what are you thinking about right now? I mean, mm -hmm. not the stuff that you're thinking about Michigan State football. You're thinking, yeah. who's going to hop who as a starting job? Jim Harbaugh is uh, doing a satellite camp thing. It's uh, life, life is good for the Wolverines right now. Let, let, let me ask you this, Adam, before we jump into the Wolverines. What – I mean, it, it seems like Michigan State, they, they got knocked down last year and they're just being beaten uh, while they're on the ground here. Uh, yeah. What what should people be optimistic about? I mean, what what hope is there to hit seven wins or, or go beyond that for next season? I hope that you can hope for five hundred. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. I mean, hope hope for a six a six and six season. I don't I don't really see any other way around it. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, not. And again, and this, and I didn't have a, a bright forecast for Michigan State, um, even assuming that those three were going to be on. But I mean, yeah. Once I learned who it was, and then I remember doing a preview shortly after that. It was just like a quick look, and I left those guys out. I don't know if readers, uh, nobody commented and, and said anything, but I left those guys out. And then if you if you read it, then you'll say, okay, wow, where's Demetri Vance? Where's Josh King? Where's Donnie Corley? Well, it's because I knew that they weren't going to be back. Yeah. And even then, I mean, I thought best best case scenario, five, six, seven wins if you get lucky. You know, you get a couple of bounces to go your way. Mm -hmm. but I think I think for me, if if I'm trying I think for, as a morale as a morale hit, you're you're a guy on this football team, and you see your your team, your university is being dragged through the headlines. Not only the sexual assault thing, the Nat, the Dr. Nasser thing. I mean, I, I I have to believe that this kind of this has to weigh on guys. I mean, these are college kids; these are eighteen to twenty two year old guys, and they're and they're seeing you know their schools. Uh, their school plastered all over the news for the wrong reasons. I, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, if if I'm trying to look at things optimistically, which again, like, I think Michigan State, this is this is one of those seasons when you look at it and you can say, like, yeah, there's a there's a win cap here. Like, even in the best case scenario, like they're not going 12 and 0. I mean, I don't I don't care. You can come up with some hilarious thing for me to do if they go 12 and 0, but like they're not going 12 and 0. When you have Ohio State on the road, Michigan on the road, um, you have a game against Penn State at home. I mean, it's just – there's a cap. But, I mean, Lewerke showed promise last year. I mean, if he can come in and ball out, that's a big plus. I, you still have Scott in the backfield. And, I mean, 
as bad as the defense has been, um, uh, certainly last year, and I mean, I maybe I'm in the minority, but I think even the year before that, it showed some cracks um, since Narduzzi has been gone. But D'Antonio is still a defensive coach. I mean, they've shown they can develop guys on that side of the ball. So, I mean, maybe a hit on a guy or two there. Um, they turn into a semi-decent group. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you got to just uh, ride on the work and hope he can uh, be, the, be the savior, I guess. Uh, if, he's watch, if he's watching, no pressure, Brian. I mean, plus, you know, just coming off that broken leg by Gabriel Peppers. I mean, <laughs> the weight of a program is on a guy who has done what? He's a backup, a redshirt freshman yeah, backup. I'm trying to be positive here. <laughs> yeah, good, good luck, Brian. Good luck, Brian. Now, uh, switching gears. I mean, like I said, Michigan coming along. There's really not, there's, there's really not anything that I can find to, to criticize. Honestly, I mean, and I'm not an overly critical person, but I mean, right now, with this year, we're not having the all oh, my Jim Harbaugh and and his uh antics on satellite camps it's like now it's like okay this is how about it. it's almost like people just accepted it now i mean they did that's it they try they try to stop the satellite camps he still you know he still does it it's not a it's not as much of a hoopla as it used to be but i, I found this interesting and uh angelique the detroit news uh cut jim Har uh, jim harbaugh's interview monday on the rich eisen show and uh harbaugh told eisen this and I quote, you can look at part of the depth chart, maybe five or six, maybe seven that are returning as starters. A lot of the depth chart has been wiped clean at the first string level. So, so that has created a lot of competition and created opportunities for the fellows that have been sitting behind a guy for a year or two years. Another opportunity is to be the full-time starter and show what they can do. The waters are hot in that regard. That's the, mon that's the money line right there. <laughs> the waters are hot in that regard. It's been a fun team to be coaching. We've been working since winter conditioning, spring ball. Now we're into summer conditioning. We've got a young team, but we've got some good returning starters as well at some key positions, which is good. But it's a young and talented team, and it's our job to coach them and get them ready. And their job is to get themselves prepared to carry the load. But it's much better than having a young and untalented team. That would be the worst possible uh, scenario. So, yeah, basically they're a young, talented team. <laughs> I, th I think uh, that's what – that's the impression I get from that. I think that's what Jim Harbaugh is trying to say. It's a young talent, and it is. 19 guys that we were all well familiar with last year. You knew everything <laughs> about them. They're no longer there. Yeah. So I know the hot topic is, and, he, and Harbaugh says, waters are hot in regards to the starting position. Everybody – Wants to talk about Brandon Peters. Is he gonna hop Wilton Spate? Wilton Spate with the surgery, uh, but I mean he did he did well at the uh, what was it the Steve uh, um, what is that car? What's the quarterback guy? Steve Clarkson. No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He did he did well out there. I believe it was, it was in uh, Colorado. I still think Wilton Spate's the guy. I know it's gonna be a, a topic to debate. Yes, Brandon Peters looked good in in uh, in spring ball. If you had Thomas, if you were the coach right now, if you're Jim Harbaugh, you have to give the offense. Where are you going with Brandon Peters, who yes looked good in spring ball, but hasn't done anything, or Will Spate, who won nine games as a first year starter, third highest passer rate. I'm padding this here because I feel like there's no argument, but there is. Yeah, I mean, I I think I will I will put it this way: when we entered spring, I thought there was no chance. I thought Spate would, would have it locked up, no problem. And I, not that I don't like Peters, but I mean, who beats out a returning starter who won 10 games? <laughs> like, it doesn't, ha I mean, I guess technically nine because he missed the, the right, Indiana. Indiana game. But if he would have been healthy, they would have beaten Indiana. So I'm just going to give him 10. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, like you, that just doesn't happen. I mean, it's so rare. Like you would have to be so good to do that. But I will say, I mean, he looked good in the spring. Um, good enough to that I went, well, you know, maybe, maybe he can push him a little bit. Um, if, if I'm Harbaugh, I throw out the balls the first week of uh, fall practice here, um, you know, camp and see what they got. But 
I think it's going to be Spate. And I, I think one of the reasons, too, why if I'm Harbaugh, you got you got to go with Spate is this isn't a normal year. I mean, most years Michigan doesn't start in a neutral game against Florida, who has a really good defense. I mean, this isn't yeah, – Is that where you want Brandon Peters making his debut? Yeah. I don't think. Yeah, like you, you're really going to have Wilton Spate on your bench and right. you're going to put a guy out there um, and, and just, you know – Maybe this sounds rough, but hope he doesn't crap his pants in national right. TV. It's like, well, hey, man, you better remember those big road games when you're at Avon High School. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, this is, it's a little, it's a little different show. Yeah, I, I, you can't. I, I would be just blown away if Brandon Peters is a starter at Florida. Blown away. I'm not saying that he's not going to push Wilton. I'm not going to say that there might be even weeks where he's nipping at him and and really give him a go. But it's Wilton's job, and there's no way it's Brandon Peters. To me, unless Wilton Spate just uh, completely nose dies or gets injured. Yeah, which I, I mean, I, I just don't think Spate is the type of guy that would do that, you know, given how much he had to compete last year to get the job. Um, I, I just, I don't think he's a guy who's going to back down from that kind of challenge. But um, I know a lot of people are saying the sort of the, the reasonable opinion, whatever you want to say, is that, well, Maybe Peters will pass him by the end of the year, you know, when he gets some more experience and stuff. And Wilton will be gone. I mean, Wilton will go to the NFL after this year. And, yeah, <laughs> but, and then, but then it's Brandon Peters' job. I completely agree. Yeah, This is yeah. definitely something I have – I feel like it gets overlooked so much with the Wilton Spate discussion is Wilton Spate was – I don't know if he was the last – quote. put it this way, Wilton Spate – they. Who committed at quarterback after Will and Spate committed? Let me spit it out again. Alex Malzone, Zach Gentry. Uh, I mean, Shane Morris was there. I mean, how many people did Will and Spate have to beat to even stay in the rotation, let alone become the starter? I mean, he outlasted everybody, and that that's a quality I think that, that gets overlooked a lot because as soon as Harbaugh went and got Zach Gentry, and that was technically the first quarterback recruit that he signed, but they can they converted him to a tight end. His first quarterback at Michigan. So that everybody's like, oh, well, this is a Harbaugh quarterback. This is uh yeah. there's no way Wilton Spade's gonna play. And Wilton Spade just kept getting brushed aside, brushed aside, brushed aside. What Alex they signed, you know, Alex Malzone. And then all of a sudden it's like boom, the, you're looking at a real possibility that Wilton Spade's a starter. I remember Wilton telling me that Brady Hope, they considered burning his red shirt. And so, I mean, wow. you're telling me that this guy is not starter quality. I mean, he was never – Shane Morris was never above Wilton Spade, ever. Yeah. I mean, that's, I feel that's stuff that has to be remembered about Wilton. Look at all the guys that he had to compete against to get there. And they're still – you know, and they signed a big uh, blue-chip quarterback and, and Brandon Peters. And, and still, I mean, Wilton Spade was neck and neck. I know that Jim Harbaugh said – that Jake Rudock was heads and shoulders the best quarterback. But, I mean, I've talked to some guys, and they they were telling me that Wilton was right there with Jake, too, pressing him for the starting job. So, I, I mean, mean I, yeah, I mean, I've been I, on the door tap for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of these things where people get – they're so tantalized by, to me, what I call the new toy mentality. Yeah. Which they get a new guy in, and they're like, oh, man, the, you know, this is gonna he's gonna win four straight Heisman's and be yeah. number one overall in the NFL draft. Well, guys, that usually doesn't happen. Um, it's it's kind of rare considering you know only one person's ever won multiple Heisman's. But you know that the ridiculous scenario aside, does Brandon Peters have a better arm than Wilton Spate? Yeah, can he throw certain well, passes? I mean, does he? No. It, it, I, looked, it looked I mean, it looked good in the spring game. I mean, well, I, I think Shane Morris threw harder. The, oh, I agree. Well, and but does that mean he has a better arm? I mean, he, he threw harder, but he, he I mean, was I, accurate. I think, I think Morris had a better arm. I just don't think he was a better quarterback. Shane Shane played baseball, man, and I told and it's completely unrelated. I remember talking to him last year, and he told me that he regretted quitting baseball. And that's not saying that he should have played baseball. I'm not putting words in his mouth. He, yeah, he really liked baseball, and he said he would still, you know would would still play it i mean he likes to play it. football is his passion i mean and he's going to be the starter at central michigan I think he'll he'll be fine up there but um yeah shane shane morris threw shane morris i think probably threw harder than any of them he had a monster monster it just usually went to the other team 
Um, yeah, or just didn't look good. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but Jim Fitch was talking about that, that Shane had to learn how to put more touch. It wasn't so much the the velocity on it. It was more, you know, put a little air under it, put, put a little touch on it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's my thing. Like, Peters has all these tantalizing things where you look and – it wouldn't be hard for me to sit here and say, like, yeah, I could see him playing in the NFL down the line. I, I really could. But mm-hmm. at the same time, though, I mean, we haven't seen him do it in a real game. Um, as much as people want to read into the spring, and, you know, I admit I was just talking him up based on the spring, but defense, the defenses don't play the same in the spring. They're almost right. always softer. We know that Spate was playing against the first team. Um I know they mixed them f- through, so it's not clear cut. Okay, Spade played the first; he played the second. But we do we do know realistically that Spate had the more difficult defense to play against in the spring. Um, I, I think Peters was with him um, certainly at that point, but also one day is not the better mm-hmm. quarterback overall. I, I think people forget that and. I think people might be taking spate for granted. <laughs> they are. I mean, the people. I mean, they took Jake Rudak for granted, mm-hmm. um, and then after he leaves, and you look back and say, "Oh, Jake Rudak, Jake Rudak." These same people, Jake Rudak sucks. Jake, why did this guy? It was horrible. Like who, the interception at Utah. And, oh my God, Jake Rudak. No. And then, if Michigan you know, made Jake Rudak last year, they win the Big Ten. Wow, I, without, I mean, I remember Jabril was saying without Jake Rudock, they don't win uh, that Citrus Bowl. They don't. They oh don't no, win, they don't win ten games that year. I'll say, mm-hmm. and I, I'll I'll say, um, shoot, my my train of thought it just went. <laughs> That's my ADHD kicking in right there. I swear, I had I had it, I had it right in my mind. Uh, a point you were just talking about it, and it. And it just it just completely slipped. Oh, with Brandon Peters, eye test wise, mm-hmm. yeah. If, okay, if you just look, if that was your very first time seeing Wilton Spate, and that was your very first time seeing Brandon Peters, you're gonna go, "Wow, Brandon Peters has a cannon! Holy yeah. crap! Who's this other guy? He is wildly inaccurate." And <laughs> I understand that part. But yeah, we're not. There's a lot more that goes into that. Just like that, you know, that's one spring scrimmage, like you said, but. Yeah, Brandon Peters build wise, I like his delivery. He's got he's got that classic strong arm. To, he's, he's that classic strong arm quarterback. I mean, I don't know if there's a another word to, to uh, describe him. He's when I think Brandon when I think Brandon Peters, I think like just zip on the ball. I, he's gonna be he's gonna be a very good quarterback next year. I and I and the thing about. About Peters is like I, I legitimately of the Harbaugh quarterbacks that he's he's brought in so far, I I think outside of Joel Milton, who is their new commit, um, for what eight eighteen yeah eighteen, um, I think Peters has the highest ceiling of anyone. But again, I mean, Shane Morris had an insanely high ceiling. You know that doesn't guarantee anything. You got it once you get on the field, then it's a whole different animal. And I mean. Spate may have been a three star, but it doesn't matter now. <laughs> He's been uh, uh, Malzon, yeah. Malzon was a four star. Zach Gentry was a four star. Uh, Dylan McCaffrey is coming in. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. So far, out of all, just uh, athletic wise, I, I would take. I would say probably Brandon Peters is more is probably the more prototypical guy because I mean, I think he's about six four, six five. He's not quite as tall as Wilton. He's almost as tall as Wilton. Mm-hmm. But um, he does he does have that more power quarterback meant, and, and I don't know maybe I'm I'm just I might be talking out of my butt right now I don't know he's got <laughs> a good arm okay he's got a good arm but dang Wilton Spate is not a dirt quarterback if you are if you are a Michigan State if you're a fan of an any other school I would not turn up my nose at Wilton Spate's a quarterback no thank you I no I would I'll, Wilton Spate's a quarterback. Okay, I'm cool with that. You know that. Why? Why Michigan fans can't do the same thing? I don't know. I mean, I know, I know. Penn State fans may try to kill me for saying this, but JT Barry is the only guy in the Big Ten I'd take over Wilton Spate heading into the season. He's the only guy, and and even then, like he wouldn't be that great of a fit for for what Michigan runs. So I mean, if you're Michigan, I think in the Big Ten, Spate is 
your best option of any of those quarterbacks. But I mean, I like I like Trace McSorley, but I mean, if you look at if you look at all things considered, I mean, Wilkins what six six. I remember mm-hmm. saying that he lost twenty pounds. So he was like two forty three last year, so he's around two twenty three yeah. this year. He's gotten faster. I mean, uh, yeah. It's yeah. Like, uh, as, as far as just size wise, I mean, yeah. Well, you can't you can't go wrong. If it, I mean, he's a big, tall quarterback. He can see everything. He's got he's got a good enough arm. But uh, I like I like Trace McSorley a lot, and I think it's probably because he's got that little guy. He's not little, little, but um, um you know, he's not <laughs> six six. I mean, he's he's six he's six foot tall and cleats on yeah. cement. I, I'll say that. You know? I'm not as high on him. I, I think he's a, his stats are a little bit overblown, but uh. well, I and you know what? And maybe and I'm romanticizing this a little bit because I gotta tell you, watching that comeback last year at the Big Ten Championship oh, game, yeah. and you're like, who in the hell is this kid? Like, I mean, I knew who he was. <laughs> I knew that he was a good quarterback, and then I'm like, and you're like, wow. I mean, uh, but statistically, and given what Penn State's uh, Penn State's People are pretty high on the Nittany Lions this year. I mean, realistically, not to get off topic, I mean, Saquon Barkley or Trace McSorley might be, you know, Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year this year. I mean, they're two guys uh-huh. that you have to at least consider. And I'll, I'll, preseason list. I'll, just, I'll just leave it at this for my opinion. On preseason list, you got to put them on there. You have to. I mean, I, I understand. I, I just, for me, if I'm looking at the teams last year. You got to put Will and you got to put Wilton on there. Yeah. I, uh, Barkley was better than any running back Michigan had last year. Godwin was oh, yeah. better than any receiver, and that was what McSorley got to work with. So that's I'll I'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> well, that, uh, that is, that's true. That uh, that that's true too. So uh, I'm melting up here. So I think we're gonna yeah. have, we're gonna have to. Yeah, I was talking. To, my uh, air conditioning was not today on a day like this. I don't know. It just takes a little bit long. It's not. Uh, it wasn't cooperating. So. I'm up here sweating profusely. Before we go, though, I do want to take the chance uh, real quick to mention, if you like baseball, of course you do. I like baseball. Love baseball. Everybody does. Uh, two big games coming up here in the mid-Michigan in the, in the uh, I guess they call it the Great Lakes Bay region now. I call it the Tri-Cities. They call it the Great Lakes Bay region, whatever. <laughs> uh, at Dow Diamond, June 19th. You can see the Flint area's all-stars against all the best players from Bay City, Saginaw uh, areas. And I'll tell you what, the North, always talented. Baseball is huge. I mean, Bay City, Western, you get Tim Mc, Coach Tim McDowell just won a 700th game wow. uh, this year. You have Coach Andy uh, at Saginaw Heritage. He's won 1,000 games. Uh, you have uh, Jeff Hart at Bay City, John Glenn. Uh, he's won – I think he won – Got his 700th last year. I mean, just incredible amount of talent. And the Flint Flint area uh, isn't what it used to be. I'll say that. But we do have a lot of talented guys uh, going to play in that game. So check that out. June 19th at Dow Diamond. You can get tickets on the Great Lakes Loons, Great Lakes Loons website. Get to play at a beautiful stadium. There will be the Midwest League Home Run Derby afterward. There will be um, – there's tailgating. There's, like, country music stuff. Going on out there, I say I like country music stuff, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, bounce houses, Jim Harbaugh and recruits will not be there, but there will be bounce houses. <laughs> and uh, it's just a huge, huge event, really fun for these guys. You know, uh, all of the time they'll get to hang out with minor leaguers, take batting practice with minor leaguers. Uh, we'll throw out some some of, some of the all-stars from the north and the south, and they'll get to shag, shag out in the out, outfield while these guys are uh, trying to hit them out. So. Um, and then June 21st is the Mott Bruin All-Star Game, which is just for the Flint area. So that's all the best Flint area seniors. And if uh, your team plays in the league against Flint teams, you'll be included in that. So, you know, there's guys from like Corona and North Branch and stuff in my city. So uh, all those rosters, or both of those rosters, rather, are on the Sports and the Mitten Facebook page, page. So check them out. I have the game times. I have the rosters. I have the coaches. It's uh, exciting, really exciting time for, for Flint area baseball. This will be our third all-star game up at Dow Diamond, really. Uh, so, you know, congrats to Sean Brown of Mott College. He does a great job putting that on. Thanks to all the local coaches uh, who help us select the teams. And 
and everything. And, and same goes with the Mount Bruin Club game. And that's been going on since 1984. And it's uh, kind of a, a who's who, uh, you know, in the Flint area. It goes to these games and uh you know really support it it's awesome you know you, you see all you see all the old timers like judge uh duncan beagle uh you know you see uh shoot i'm trying i'm trying to think of everybody uh coach mahan shows up uh coach walt head uh he won 800 games at saginaw valley it's just all kinds of all kinds of great stuff so i'll stop rambling about it check out the rosters on the sports and then facebook page don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Adam Biggers 81 and myself at T Bendit. I can't talk anymore. That was long winded. Yeah, I get, I get like that about bit. I get like that about baseball. So uh, we're sports in the mitten. We want to thank Mr. Spots in Ann Arbor for uh, keeping us fat when we're down there. And I want to thank everybody out there for watching and listening. I'm Adam. He's Thomas. Have a great night. We'll talk to you next time.